sir, I didn't think it polite to listen. Well, I am sorry for that. For your sake, I don't play accurately. Anyone can play accurately, but I play with a wonderful expression. As far as the piano is concerned, sentiment is my forte. I keep silence for life. Yes, sir. Oh, and then, speaking of the science of life, do you have those cucumber sandwiches cut for Lady Bracknell? Yes, sir. Oh, excellent. Oh, well, Lady, by the way, I see from your book that on Thursday night, when I was dining with Lord Shorten and Mr. Worthing, that eight bottles of champagne entered as having been consumed. Yes, sir. Eight bottles and a pint. I wonder why it is that the bachelor's establishment, the servants invariably drink champagne. I ask merely for information. I attribute it to the superior quality of the wine, sir. I have often observed that in married households, the wine is rarely of a first-rate brand. Good heavens, is marriage really so demoralizing as that? I suppose it's quite a pleasant state. I don't have much experience with it myself. I've only been married the once. That came as a misunderstanding <laughs> between myself and the uh, young person. I don't know that I'm that much interested in your family life, Lane. No, sir, neither am I. <laughs> Very natural, I am sure. That will do, Lane. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lane's views on match seem rather lax. We, if the lower orders can't set an example for us, then what on earth is the point of them? They seem, as a class, to have absolutely no moral responsibility. Mr. Ernest Worthy. Ernest, my dear fellow, what brings you up to town? Oh, pleasure, oh. pleasure. What brings one anywhere? <laughs> Eating. <laughs> As usual, I see, Algy. Even I believe it is customary in modern society to take some slight refreshment at five o'clock. Oh, where have you been since last Thursday? In the country. What on earth do you do there? Oh, when one is in town, one amuses oneself. When one is in the country, one amuses other people. It is excessively boring. Mm -hmm. Do other people you amuse? Uh, neighbors, neighbors. <laughs> Got nice neighbors in your part of um, Shropshire. Perfectly horrible. <laughs> Never speak to one of them. Yeah. How immensely you must amuse them. And by the way, Shropshire is your county, is it not? Uh, Shropshire? Yes, yes, of course. Hello! Why all these cups? Why cucumber sandwiches? Why such reckless extravagance in one so young? Uh, Who is wait, coming to tea? Merely Aunt Augusta and Gwendolyn. How perfectly delightful. I don't agree with it. My Aunt Augusta will approve of your being here, though. May I ask why? Well, my dear fellow, the way you flirt with Gwendolyn is perfectly disgraceful. It is almost as bad as the way Gwendolyn flirts with you. I'm in love with Gwendolyn. I came to town expressly to propose. I thought you'd said you'd come up for pleasure. I call that business. It's <laughs> been unromantic, you are. <coughs> it's very romantic to be in love. There is nothing romantic about a proposal. One may be accepted. One usually is, I believe. It is the very essence of romance, is uncertainty. If I ever get married, I will certainly try to forget the fact. <laughs> I've no doubt about that, dear Roger. The divorce court was specially invented for those memories so curiously constituted. Oh, divorces are made in heaven. Excuse me, would you lay off the cucumber sandwiches? They are cut specially for Lady Crack. Well, you've been eating them all the time. Uh, yes. But that is quite a different matter. She is my aunt. <laughs> I wonder. Bread and butter. The bread and butter is for Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn is devoted to bread and butter. I'm very good at bread and butter it is too. Well, you need not eat it as we're going to eat it all. 
You have, because if you're married to her already, and I don't think you are married to her already, and I don't think you ever will be. Why on earth do you say that? Mm. For one thing, girls never marry the men they flirt with. Girls don't think it right. It accounts for the extraordinary number of bachelors one sees all over the place. That is nuts. Well, in the second thing, I don't give my consent. Your consent? My dear fellow, Gwendolyn is my first cousin. And before I allow you to marry her, you must first answer the question of Cecily. Cecily? What do you mean, Cecily? I don't know anyone of the name of Cecily. Uh, Blaine, could you bring back a cigarette case that Mr. Worthing left in the smoking room last time he dined here, please? Yes, sir. Do you mean to say you've had my cigarette case all this time. I wish to goodness you would let me know. I've been writing frantic letters to Scotland Yard about it. It's very nearly offering a large reward. I wish you would offer a large reward. I happen to be more than usually hard up. There's no good offering a large reward now that the thing is found. Oh, yes. That is one way of looking at it. However, now that I look at the inscription inside the thing, I see it is not yours after all. Yeah, of course it's mine. You've seen me with it a hundred times. You've got no right. Whatsoever to read what's inside. It's a very ungentlemanly thing to read a private cigarette case. It is absurd to have a far and fast rule about what one should and shouldn't read. More than half of modern society depends on what one shouldn't read. I am quite aware of that fact, dear Archie. don't put much to discuss about culture. This is one sort of thing one talks in private. I simply want my cigarette case back. Ah, yes, but this isn't your cigarette case. You, this cigarette case, is a gift from someone of the name of Cecily, and you said you didn't know anyone of that name. Well, if you must know, Cecily happens to be my aunt. Your aunt! <laughs> yes, charming old lady she is too. Lived in Tombridge Wells? Just give it back to me, I Ah, yes, but why does she address herself as little? From little Cecily to her, with her fondest love. Oh, dear fellow, what on earth is there in some aunts are tall, some aunts are not tall. It's not about the matter. An aunt may be in love to be beside her herself. You seem to think that every aunt should be like your aunt. That is absurd. Just give it back to me, Uncle. Ah, yes, but why does your aunt call you her uncle? <laughs> From dear little Cecily, with her fondest love to her dear Uncle Jack. There is no objection I would make to an aunt being a small aunt, but why <laughs> an aunt? No matter what her size may be, she should call her own nephew her uncle. I can see no logical explanation. And besides, your name isn't Jack, it is Ernest. It isn't Ernest, it's Jack. You've always told me, for not I have introduced you to everyone as Ernest. You are just at the name of Ernest. You look as if your name was Ernest. You are the most earnest looking person I ever saw in my entire life. It is absurd you're saying your name isn't Ernest. Here, I have your card. Mr. Ernest Worthy. Boo! B4. <laughs> now, I shall keep this in case you ever tried to deny to me, or to Gwendolyn, or to anyone else that your name is Ernest. <coughs> well, my name is Ernest Talman. Jack in the country, the cigarette case was given to me in the country. Ah, here we are beginning to get close to the truth. Now, why does your little aunt Cecily, who lives in Tunbridge Wells, call you her uncle? Come on, old boy, you'd better have that with the whole thing. Oh, dear boy, you talk exactly like you're a dentist. Have you always talk like a dentist when one isn't a dentist? Produces a false impression. Yeah, that is exactly what dentists do. Now, come on. Why are you earnest in the town and Jack in the country? May I say at this point that I have always suspected you of being a secret and confirmed Bunburyist, and now I am quite sure of it. Bunburyist? What do you mean by Bunburyist? I will reveal to you the meaning of that incomparable expression as soon as you explain to me why you are earnest in the town and Jack in the country. Choose my cigarette case first. Here it is. Now, Fred, choose your explanation and make it improbable. Dear fellow, there's nothing improbable about my explanation at all. The fact is perfectly ordinary. Mr. Thomas Cardew, who adopted me, may be in his will guardian to his granddaughter, Miss Cecily Cardew. Cecily refers to me as 
uncool for motives of respect you cannot possibly appreciate, <laughs> lives in my place in the country under the charge of her admirable governess, Miss Prison. Where is that place in the country? <laughs> you are not to know, my dear boy, you were not invited. I mean, family tell you the place is not in Shropshire. I suspected that. I have bungled all over Shropshire on two separate occasions. And not fair of a thing. Now, why are you Ernest in the town and Jack in the country? Dear Amateur, don't you ready to be able to understand my real motives? You are hardly serious enough. When one is made guardian, one has to adopt a very high moral tone in all his subjects. It is one's duty to do so. And as a high moral tone can hardly conduce towards one's health or one's happiness, to get into town I've always pretended to have a younger brother of the name of Ernest, who lives in the old me and gets into the most dreadful of us rapes. That, my dear boy, is the whole truth, pure and simple. The truth is never pure and rarely simple. Now, this is confirmed that you are as bun boys. Now, you have just confirmed the fact, too. And what on earth do you mean? You have invented for yourself a very useful younger brother called Ernest, who allows you to escape to the town whenever you wish. <coughs> I have invented for myself a very useful, invalid, in invalid, Herman's invalid friend called Bunbury. Bunbury is perfectly invaluable. For instance, if it wasn't for Bunbury's extraordinarily bad health, I wouldn't be able to skip to the country. Or, indeed, dine with you at Willis tonight. I've really been engaged in my undergust for more than a week. I haven't asked to dine with me anywhere tonight. No, no, it is absurd. I've told you I was sending out invitations. Nothing upsets people so much as not receiving invitations. You'd much better die with your aunt with us. I have no intention of doing anything of the kind. For one, I dine there on Monday. And once a week is quite enough to dine with one's own relations. For the second thing, whenever I am there, they treat me like a member of the family. And I'm either sent down with no woman at all, or two. Now, for the third thing, I know perfectly well who she's going to seat me next to. And that is Mary Farquhar who always has a terrible habit of flirting with her own husband across the dinner table. And that sort of thing is increasingly on the rise. The amount of women who flirt with their own husband is perfectly <laughs> scandalous. It's just shameful. It is merely washing one's clean linen in public. <laughs> now, I wish to talk to you about money. Now, I know you are one. I want to tell you the rules. Not a bun wrist. When will accept me? I'm going to kill my brother. In fact, I think I'm going to kill him in any case. Cecily is a little too interested in him, which is rather a bore. So I think we're going to get rid of him. And I strongly advise you to do the same with Mr. Ban Ban, but the absurd friend with that absurd name. <laughs> Nothing will induce me to part with Bunbury. Why? Uh, if you want any married man <coughs> marries without knowing a Bunbury, has a very tedious time of it. By my Gwendolyn, she's the only girl I've ever met that I would marry, but certainly wouldn't want to know Bunbury. <coughs> then your wife will, in marriage, <coughs> be the company, and two is none. That's what I mean, is the theory. The corrupt French drama has been propounding for the last 30 years. And one that the English home has proven in half the time. For heaven's sake, don't try to be sick. Perfectly easy to be sick. It isn't easy to be anything these days. There's so much beastly competition about. Ooh, that must be not <laughs> Only relatives and creditors ring in that Wagnerian map. Now, if I go lead Aunt Augusta into the other room for a couple of minutes to give you the opportunity to propose to Gwendolyn, will you allow me to dine with you at Willis tonight? Suppose so if you want to. Oh, you must be sure about it, my good fellow. I hate people who are not sure about meals. It is so shallow of them. Lady Bracknell and Miss Fairfax. Hello, Algernon. I assume you've been behaving well. I am feeling very well, Aunt Augusta. That is hardly the same thing. In fact, the two rarely go together. Oh, dear me, aren't you smart? 
I am always smart. Am I not, Mr. Worthing? You are quite perfect, Miss Fairfax. Oh, I do hope I am not that. It would leave no room for developments, and I intend to develop in many directions. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't seen her since before her husband's death. I have never seen a woman so altered. She seems quite 20 years younger. I hear she is living entirely for pleasure now. Indeed. And now I will take a cup of tea, thank you, and one of those nice fruit and the sandwiches you promised me. Certainly, Aunt Augusta. Gwendolyn, will you sit here? Oh, thank you, Mama. But I am quite comfortable where I am. Good heavens, lady! Why are there no cucumber sandwiches? There were no cucumbers when I went to market this morning, sir. <laughs> I went down twice. Oh, no cucumbers? No, sir. Not even for ready money. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you, lady. That will be all. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I am greatly distressed to hear about there being no cucumbers on the gutter. Even for ready money. It was no matter, Algernon. We had some crumpets with Lady, my, uh, our dear friend. But it does seem to me that she is living entirely for pleasure now. Mm. I hear her hair has turned quite gold from grief. Her hair certainly has changed colour, from what cause I, of course, cannot tell. I have a little surprise for you, Algernon. Tonight, I will be sending you down with Mary Farquhar. She's such a nice woman, and so attentive to her husband. It is delightful to watch them. I am afraid I shall have to give up the pleasure of dining with you tonight, Aunt Augusta. Oh? I hope not. It would set my table completely out of order. Your uncle would have to dine upstairs. Which, fortunately, he is used to. <laughs> I've just had a telegram to say that my poor friend Bunbury has been called ill again, and that they seem to think I should be with him. Mm. This Mr. Bunbury does seem to suffer from curiously bad health. Bunbury is a dreadful invalid. Well, I believe it's quite time that Mr. Bunbury decided whether he was going to live or to die. This shilly-shallying of the question is absolutely absurd, nor do I in any way approve of the modern sympathy with invalids. I consider it morbid. Illness is hardly a trait that should be encouraged in others. Health is the primary duty of life. I would be much obliged if you would tell Mr. Bunbury from me not to have a relapse this Saturday, for I require you to organize my music for me. I will talk to Bunbury. And if he is still conscious, and I think I can promise that he'll be all right by Saturday. Now, of course, the music is a great difficulty. You see, if one plays good music, people don't listen. And if one plays bad music, people don't talk. Well, I will thank you for your assistance. I'm a few, few minutes after a few expurgations that the music will be delightful. French music I cannot possibly allow. People think it's improper, and so think either find it vulgar, which is terrible, or laugh, which is worse. But German seems a thoroughly respectful language to me, and I believe it is. Gwendolyn, you will accompany me? Certainly, Mama. <laughs> Charming day to thin, Miss Fairfax. Pray, do not talk to me about the weather, Mr. Worthing. Whenever somebody talks to me about the weather, I am quite certain they mean something else. And that makes me feel so nervous. I do mean something else. I thought so. In fact, I am never wrong. And I would like to take advantage of Lady Bracken's temporary absence. <coughs> I would certainly advise you to do so. Mama often has a way of coming back into a room suddenly that I have often had to speak to her about. <laughs> Miss Fairfax, ever since I have met you, I've admired you more than any girl I have met since I met you. <laughs> I have heard of that, and I wish at any rate you had been more demonstrative. To me, you have always had an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I was far from indifferent from you. 
We live, as I hope you know, Mr. Worthing, in an age of ideals. The very fact is talked about constantly in the more expensive monthly magazines and reached against the provincial pulpits. My ideal has always been to love someone of the name Ernest. As soon as Algernon mentioned to me that he had a friend named Ernest, I knew I was destined to love you. You really love me, Grandon? Passionately. Darling, <laughs> no, I don't know how happy you've made it. My own Ernest. But my own uh, one. You don't mean to say you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest. But your name is Ernest. <laughs> yes, yeah, like, I know it is. Supposing it was something else? Do you mean to say you can't love me then? That is clearly a metaphysical speculation. <laughs> and like most metaphysical speculations, has very little reference to the actual facts of life as we know them. Personally, darling, speak quite kindly. I don't care for the name of Ernest. I don't think the name suits me at all. Oh, it suits you perfectly. It is a divine name. It has a music of its own. It produces. Vibration. <laughs> <laughs> well, really, Gwendolyn, I think there are other names out there a lot nicer. Jack, for instance, a charming name. Jack? <coughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> there is very little music in the name Jack, if any at all indeed. It does not thrill. It produces absolutely no vibration. <laughs> I have known several Jacks, and all of which, without exception, are more than usually plain. Besides, Jack is a notorious domesticity for the name John, and I pity any woman who is married to a man named John. She would never know the true entrancing pleasure of a single moment's solitude. <coughs> the only real safe name is Ernest. Darling, I must get christened at once. I mean, we must get married at once. <laughs> There's no time to be lost. Married? Mr. Oh, no, Charlie, darling, you know that I love you, and Miss Beth, I do that need to believe you weren't absolutely indifferent to me. I adore you, but you haven't proposed yet. The subject of marriage has not even been touched upon. Well, you may I propose to you now? Well, I would certainly advise you to do so, <laughs> and I think it only best that I tell you that I am fully determined to accept. Gwendolyn! Yes, what have you to say to me? You know what I've got to say to you. <laughs> yes, but you don't say it. Gwendolyn, will you marry me? Of course I will, darling. Oh, how long you have been about it. Oh, what? I've loved no one in the world but you. Yes, but, you know, men often propose for practice. I know my brother Gerald does. All my girlfriends tell me so. <laughs> oh, you have such blue eyes, Ernest. They are quite, quite blue. I wish you should always look at me this way, especially in the presence of others. <laughs> Mr. Worthing, rise up the streets. Mama, I beg you to retire. This is no place for you. Besides, Mr. Worthing has not quite finished yet. Finish what, may I ask? I am engaged to be married to Mr. Worthing, Mama. Pardon me, you are not engaged to anyone. When you are engaged, I or your father, should his help permit it, will inform you of the fact. An engagement should be a surprise for a young woman. Pleasant or unpleasant, as the case may be. It's hardly a matter she can choose for herself. And now, I have some questions to put to you. While I'm making my inquiries, you, Gwendolyn, will wait for me below in the carriage. Mama! In the carriage, Gwendolyn! Yes, Mama. May I take a seat, Mr. Worthing? Thank you, Lady Bracknell. I'm first, son. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bound to tell you that your name is not currently on my list of eligible young men. Although I do share the same list as the dear Duchess of Bolton. We work together, in fact. However, I will be very happy to put your name in the book, as long as your answers are what a really affectionate mother requires. Do you smoke? Well, yes, I must admit I smoke. I'm glad to hear it. Any idle young men in London nowadays, a man needs an occupation of some kind. <laughs> How old are you? Twenty-five. 
29. Perfectly fine, Mary, for Mary of all age. Let us see. And may I ask about your fortune? Twenty seven ten thousand a year. In land or in investments? In investments, chiefly. I am glad to hear it. What between the duties expected of one in life and the duties exacted from one in death? Land has ceased to be a profit or a pleasure. It gives one power and keeps one from using it. I have always been of the impression that anyone who wishes to get married should either know everything or nothing. Which do you know? <laughs> I know nothing, Lady Burton. <laughs> I am very glad to hear it. <laughs> I do not prove anything that Tamta's natural ignorance. Modern, the whole theory of modern education is completely unsound. Fortunately, in England at any rate, it rarely produces any results. And now, may I ask if you do happen to have any land or housing? I own a country house with sometimes cuts attached to it, about 1,500 acres. But uh, I don't pretend, depend on it, it's my made income, God. Well, really, the folks and only people can make anything out of it. <laughs> well, a country house. How many bedrooms? No, that's no matter, we can organise that later. But I do hope that you have a townhouse. A girl with a simple, unspoiled nature such as Gwendolyn can hardly be expected to reside in the country. My own house on Belgrave Square. We've got let it up to the year to Lady Bloxham. Lady Bloxham. I don't know her. She's a lady considerably advanced in years. Nowadays, that is no sign of good character. <laughs> <laughs> could I ask what number on Belgrave Square? 149. Hmm. The unfashionable side. That is no matter, that can be altered. You mean the fashionable side? Both, if necessary. <laughs> Just on to the last small matter. Are your parents living? I've lost both my parents. Lost? To lose one parent, Mr. Worthy, could be considered Miss of Fortune. To lose both is carelessness. <laughs> was that your father? He must have been a man of some considerable wealth. I'm afraid I really don't know, Lady Brighton. Well, uh, I said I lost my parents. Be near to the truth, say my parents have lost me. I don't know who I actually am by birth. I was. Well, I was found. Found? Yes, the late Mr. Thomas Cobb, you a gentleman of a kindly and charitable disposition found me and gave me the name of Worthing because he happened to have a first-class ticket to Worthing in his pocket at the time. <laughs> Worthing is a place in Sussex. It is a seaside resort. <laughs> and where did this charitable gentleman with a first-class ticket to a seaside resort find you? In a handbag. A handbag? Yes, Lady Fractal, in a handbag, a black leather handbag with handles on it, an ordinary handbag, in fact. And then where did this Mr. Thomas Cardew find this perfectly ordinary handbag? In the cloakroom at Victoria Station. It was given to him mistakenly for his own. The cloakroom at Victoria Station? Yes, the Brighton line. <laughs> the line is immaterial! Mr. Worthing, I must say I am somewhat disturbed by what you have revealed to me. To be born, or at any rate bred in a handbag, shows a disvalue of family values that reminds one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. And I assume you know what that unfortunate movement led to. It can hardly be considered a good standing for good society. Well, pray, what would you advise me to do, Lady Brown? Well, we hardly say I would do anything to ensure Gwendolyn's happiness. I would just advise you, sir, to find some relatives before the end of the season and to present a parent of either sex before the week is out. I don't see how I could possibly manage to do that. I, I can't produce that bad bag at a moment's notice. <laughs> <laughs> Surely that's enough to satisfy you, Lady Bracknell. Me, sir, what has it would allow our daughter, whom we raised with the utmost care, to marry into a terminal terminus? and to make an alliance with a parcel. Good day.
day, Mr. Berman. Good day. Play that ghastly tune now, dear. How idiotic you are. Didn't it go off all right, old boy? You don't mean to say she refused you. Oh, it is a terrible way Gwendolyn has. She is always refusing people. I think it is most ill natured about her. Gwendolyn is right as a trivet. As far as she's concerned, we are engaged. Her mother, however, is perfectly unbearable. Never met such a gorgon. I don't know what a Gorgon is exactly, but I'm fairly sure Lady Bracken is one. She's a monster without being admitted, which is rather unfair. Pardon me, how do you, I suppose I shouldn't talk of your art this way before you. Oh no, I love hearing my relations abused. It is the only thing that makes me put up with them. The relations are simply a tedious pack of people without the remotest knowledge of how to live, nor the keenest instinct of when to die. That is nonsense. <laughs> it isn't. Isn't it? We argue about these things with you. You always want to argue about these things. That is exactly what things were made for. Upon my word, for I thought that I would shoot myself. You don't think there's any chance of Gwen becoming like her mother in 150 years, do you? <laughs> All women become like their mothers. That is their tragedy. No man does. That is his. <laughs> is that clever? It is perfectly free. And true as anything in modern society can be. Sit to death with cleverness. Everybody's clever nowadays. You can't go anywhere without being clever. Wish to goodness we had a few fuels left. We have. We do have extremely like to meet them. What do they talk about? The fools? Clever people, of course. What fools? Yeah. Oh, by the way, have you mentioned to Gwendolen the truth about being Ernest in the town and Jack in the country? Dear boy, that's the sort of thing one tells to a sweet refined girl. What extraordinary ideas you have the ways to behave to a woman. The only way is to behave to a woman or to make love to her if she is pretty and to someone else if she is plain. <laughs> that is nonsense. Isn't. And what about your brother? Hey, what about the profligate Ernest? Before the end of the week, I shall have to get rid of him. I should say he died suddenly of apoplexy in Paris. Lots of people die suddenly of apoplexy, don't they? Yes! That it's hereditary, my dear fellow. The um, sort of thing that runs in families. You'd much better say he died of a um, Severe chill. The sure severe chill isn't also great to anything of that kind. Of course it isn't. <laughs> hey, well then. Ernest gets carried off by a severe chill in Paris. That gets rid of him. I thought you said Cecily had grown rather attached to him. Wouldn't you take his hmm? Wouldn't you take his loss rather hard? That's alright. Cecily is not a silly romantic girl, I'm glad to say. She's got a capital act. Loves to go on long walks and pays no attention to her lessons. I should very much like to meet this Cecily. Take very good care. You don't. She's excessively pretty and only just 18. Have you told Gwendolyn you have an excessively pretty ward who's only just 18? <laughs> that doesn't sort of thing one blurts out to people. Yes. Cecily and Gwendolyn are certain to be great friends. I bet you anything, half an hour after they leave, they'll be calling each other sister. Women only do that after they've called each other a lot of other things. Come on, boy. We have to go if we want to go and get a good table for a good table at Willis's. It is almost seven. It is almost nearly seven. I'm not hungry. Never knew you when you weren't. Oh, yeah. What would you like to do after we've been to dinner? How about a um, visit to the theatre? Oh, no, I loathe listening. What about a visit to the, um, the club? We go to the club. Oh, no, I keep talking. Um, what about a trot, trot around the Empire at ten? Oh, I can't bear to look at things. It's so silly. Then what on earth shall we do? Nothing. Nothing? It is enormously hard work to do nothing. But then again, I don't mind hard work when there's no definitive object in mind. <laughs> Miss. Yeah. Gwendolyn, upon my word, 
Algie, kindly turn your back. I have something very particular to say to Mr. Worthing. Really, Gwendolyn, I don't think I can allow this. Algie, you always adopt a strictly immoral attitude towards life. You are not quite old enough to do so. My <laughs> only one. Ernest, we may never marry. From the look on my wife's face, I fear we never shall. Few parents nowadays pay any regard to what their children have to say to them. Respect for the young is fast dying out. Any influence I had over Mama, I lost at the age of three. <laughs> but although she may prevent us from becoming man and wife, and I may marry again and marry often, she will never stop my eternal devotion towards you. Dear Gwendolyn. The romantic origin of your nature, as relayed to me by Mama with some unpleasing comments, has stirred the inner fibres of my nature. Your Christian name has an irresistible fascination. The sweetness of your nature is irresistibly incomprehensible to me. Your address in the town at the Albany I have. What is your address in the country? The Manor House of Walton Park. We may have to do something desperate, and that will require serious consideration. I will communicate with you daily. I hear one. <laughs> Algy, you may turn your back around. Thanks. I've already turned around. <laughs> you may also ring the bell. You will let me see you in two crowds, my darling? Certainly. I will see the spare factor. Yes, sir. Mm. A glass of sherry, Lane. Yes, sir. Tomorrow, Lane, I'm going bun green. Yes, sir. Mm. Can you back all of my bungling suits, my smoking jacket, and my dinner suits as well? Yes, sir. Mm. Tomorrow looks like it will be a fine day, Lane. It never is, sir. <laughs> Lane, you are a perfect pessimist. I do my best to give satisfaction. <laughs> sir. That will do. There's a sensible, intellectual girl. The only girl I have ever cared for in my life. <laughs> Wasn't that he so used that? No, oh, nothing. I'm just a little worried for Bunbury, that's all. Don't take care, your poor friend Bunbury will get you into a serious scrape one day. I love scrapes. They are the only things that are never serious. That is nonsense, Algy. Never talk of anything but nonsense. Nobody ever does. Sometimes. 
We might have a good influence over him as prison. I'm sure you certainly would. You know geology and German, and things of that influence a man very much. I am not sure that even I could produce such an effect on a character which is, by his own brother's admission, irretrievably weak and vacillating. Indeed, I am not sure I would desire to reclaim him. I'm not in favour of this modern mania for turning bad people into good people at a moment's notice. As a man sows, so let him reap, you must put away your diary, Cecily. <laughs> Indeed, I do not see why you should keep a diary at all. I keep a diary in order to enter the wonderful secrets of my life. If I didn't write them down, I should probably forget all about them. Memory, my dear Cecily, is the diary we all carry around with us. Yes, but it often chronicles the things that have never happened and couldn't possibly have happened. I believe that memory is responsible for nearly all the three-volume novels that Mewdy sends us. Do not speak slightingly of the three-volume novel. I wrote one myself in my earlier days. Did you really, Miss Prism? How wonderfully clever you are. I hope it did not end happily. I don't like novels that end happily. They depress me so much. <laughs> <laughs> the good ended happily and the bad unhappily. That is what fiction means. I suppose so. But it seems very unfair. And was your novel ever published? Alas, no. The manuscript was unfortunately abandoned. I used the term in the sense of lost or mislaid. To your work, child, these speculations are profitless. But I see they Dr. Charles will come up through the garden. Dr. Tashwell, this is indeed a surprise. And how are we this morning? Miss Prism, you are, I trust, well. Miss Prism has just been complaining of a slight headache. I think a stroll around the garden with you would do her so much good, Dr. Jasper. Cecily, I have mentioned nothing about a headache. No, dear Miss Prism, but I felt it instinctively that you had one. Indeed, I was thinking about that and not about my German lesson when the rector came up through the garden. I hope, Cecily, you are not inattentive. Oh, I'm afraid I am. <laughs> <laughs> that is strange. Were I fortunate enough to be Miss Prism's pupil, I would hang upon her lips. <coughs> and Cecily, you will read your political economy in my absence. The chapter on the fall of the rupee you may have made it is somewhat you. The sensational. Even these metallic problems have their melodramatic side. <laughs>
fact, I have been very bad in my own small way. Oh, I don't think you should be so proud of that. Though I'm sure it must have been very pleasant. Well, it's much pleasanter being here with you. I can't understand how you're here at all. <coughs> Uncle Jack won't be back till next Monday. Oh, that is a great shame. I'm obliged to leave on the first train on Monday morning. There is a business appointment I have in London that I'm anxious to miss. Couldn't you miss it anywhere but in London? No, the appointment is in London. Oh. Well, of course I know how important it is to miss business arrangements if one is to retain any sense of the beauty of life. But still, I think you had better wait until Uncle Jack gets back. I know he wants to speak to you about your emigrating. About my what? You're emigrating. He's gone up to buy your outfit. Oh, I wouldn't trust Jack to buy my outfit. He has no taste in neckties whatsoever. <laughs> I don't think you will require neckties. Uncle Jack is sending you to Australia. Australia? And sooner die. Well, he said at dinner on Wednesday that you would have to choose between this world, the next world, and Australia. Well, the accounts I have heard of you. The next world and Australia are not too encouraging. This world is good enough for me, Cousin Cecil. Yes, but are you good enough for it? I'm afraid I'm not that, and that is why I would like you to reform me. <laughs> Could you make that your mission, if you would? I'm afraid I have no time this afternoon. Would you mind my reforming myself this afternoon? It is rather quixotic of you, but I think you should try. Thank you. I will. I feel better already. <laughs> you are looking a little worse. That is because I am hungry. Oh, how thoughtless of me. I should have remembered that when one is going to lead an entirely new life, one requires regular and wholesome meals. Won't you come in? Yes, but uh, could I have a pudding hole first? They never have an appetite in the sound of Rosalind. Uh, Maricamia? Um, no, I, I would rather have a, a pink rose. Why? Because you are like a pink rose, cousin Cecily. I don't think you should speak to me like that. Miss Prison never says such things to me. Then Miss Prison is a short sighted old lady. Uh, you are the prettiest girl I ever saw. Miss Prison says all good looks are a snare. Then they are a snare. Any sensible man would like to be called her. Mm. I don't think I should care to catch a sensible man. I shouldn't know what to talk to him about. <laughs> <laughs> You're too much alone here, Dr. Chashford. You should get married. A misanthrope, I can understand. A woman throat. <coughs> Never. Believe me, I do not deserve so. Neologistic a phrase. The precept as well as the practice of the primitive church was distinctly against matrimony. Well, that is obviously the reason the primitive church has not lasted until the present day. But you do not seem to realize, dear doctor, that by persistently remaining single, a man converts himself into a permanent public temptation. Oh. A man should be more careful. The very act of celibacy leads weaker vessels astray. Um, but is a man? Not equally attractive when married? No married man is attractive, except to his wife. <laughs> and often I've been told not even to her. <laughs> <laughs> that depends on the intellectual sympathies of the woman. Maturity can be dependent upon Ripeness is to be trusted young women are oh, I spoke horticulturally. My metaphor was drawn from fruits. Where is Cecily? <laughs> um, perhaps she followed us to the schools. Mr. Worthing. Mr. Worthing? I return sooner than I expected. <laughs> 
what seem to us bitter, bitter trials are often blessings in disguise. Mm. This seems to me to be a blessing of a perfectly obvious kind. Uncle <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jack, how wonderful to see you back so soon. What horrid clothes you've got on. Do go check. Cecily! <laughs> my child, my child. Whatever is the matter, Uncle Jack? You look as if you've got a toothache. And I've got such a surprise for you. Who do you think is waiting for you in the dining room? Your brother! Who? <laughs> Your brother, Alice. He arrived about half an hour ago. <laughs> Nonsense, I don't have a brother. Oh, don't say that. However badly he may have behaved to you in the past, he is still your brother. I'll go and get him. And you will shake hands with him, won't you, Uncle Jack? These are very joyful tidings. <laughs> <laughs>
don't like your clothes. <laughs> Perfectly ridiculous in them. Why don't you go and change? At any rate, better than always being overdressed as you are. If I am ever occasionally a little overdressed, I always make up for it by being immensely overeducated. Your vanity is ridiculous. Your conduct and outrage, and your bare presence in my garden utterly absurd. However, you need to leave by the 4-5 train. I hope you have a pleasant trip back to town. This bungering, as you would call it, has not been a great success for you. I think it has been a great success. I'm in love with Cecily. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I must make arrangements for the bank before I go and have to see her again. Oh, bless it. Oh, I mean that. <laughs> <laughs> you were with Uncle Jack. He's gone to fetch the dog cart for me. Oh, is he going to take you for a nice drive? He's going to send me away. Part? I'm afraid so. It is a very painful part. It is always painful to part from someone whom one has known for a very brief space of time. <laughs> the absence of old friends one can endure with equanimity, but even a momentary separation from anyone to whom one has just been introduced is almost unbearable. Thank you. The dog cart is waiting, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Five minutes. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so, Cecily, I hope I do not offend you if I state, quite frankly, that you seem to me to be the visible personification of absolute perfection. I think your frankness does you great credit, Ernest. <laughs> if you will allow me, I will copy your remarks into my diary. <laughs> <laughs> your diary? Keep a diary. I'd give anything to look at it. Um, may I? Oh no. You see, it is simply a very young girl's record of her own thoughts and impressions, and consequently meant for publication. <laughs> it appears in volume four. I hope you will order it. <laughs> but don't stop, Ernest. I delight in taking down from dictation. I have reached absolute perfection. You may go on. I'm quite ready for more. <laughs> Um, uh, Don't cough, Ernest. When one is dictating, one should speak fluently and not cough. Besides, I don't know how to spell cough. Um, Cecily, from the moment I first met you, I have dared to love you wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. Uh, I don't think you should tell me that you love me. Wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. Hopelessly doesn't seem to make much sense now, does it? Oh, Cecily, the dog cart is waiting, sir. Tell it to come back next week <laughs> at the same hour. <laughs> Uncle Jack would be very much annoyed if he knew we were staying on until next week at the same hour. I don't care about Uncle Jack. I don't care about anyone else in the world but you. I love you, Cecily. You will marry me, won't you? You silly boy, of course. Where we have been engaged for the last three months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> exactly three months, eh? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, how did we become engaged? <laughs> well, ever since Uncle Jack first confessed to us that he had a younger brother who was very wicked and bad, you, of course, have formed the chief topic of conversation between myself and Miss Prism. And of course, a man who is much talked about is always very attractive. One feels there must be something in him after all. <laughs> I dare say it was foolish of me, Ernest, but I fell in love with you. Die! And when was the engagement actually settled? On the 14th of February last. Worn out by your entire ignorance of my existence, I determined to settle the matter one way or the other. And after a long struggle with myself, I accepted you under this dear old tree here. <laughs> the next day I went and bought this little ring in your name, <laughs> and this is the bangle with the true love's knot I promised you always to wear. <laughs> Did I mind you this? It's 
very pretty, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yes. You have wonderful taste, Ernest. It's the excuse I've always given for your leading such a bad life. And this is the box in which I keep all your dear letters. But Cecil, I haven't written you any letters. You need hardly remind me of that, Ernest. <laughs> Three times a week, and sometimes oftener. <coughs> uh, may I, may I be a couple? Oh no, they would make you far too conceited. The three who woke me after we've broken off the engagement are so beautiful and so badly spelled that even now I can hardly read them without crying a little. <laughs> <laughs> Was our engagement ever broken off? Of course. On the 22nd of last March. You can read the entry if you like. Today I broke off my engagement with Ernest. I feel it's better to do so. The weather continues charming. Cecily, <laughs> <laughs> I'm very hurt to hear that you broke off the engagement. What had I done? I had done nothing. I'm hurt that he broke off the engagement, particularly when the weather was so charming. <laughs> broken it off at least once. But I forgave you before the week was out. What a perfect angel you are, Cecily. <laughs> you dear romantic boy. I hope your hair curls naturally, does it? Yes, with a little help from others. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. You won't ever break off our engagement again, Cecily. I don't think I could now that I've actually met you. Oh. Besides, of course, there is the question of your name. Yes. <laughs> you mustn't laugh at me, Ernest, but it had always been a girlish dream of mine to love someone whose name was Ernest. That name seems to inspire absolute confidence. I pity any poor married woman whose husband is not called Ernest. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't mean to say you couldn't love me if I had some other name. I might respect you, Ernest. I might admire your character, but I don't think I could give you my undivided attention. Your rector here, I assume, is well versed in all the rites and ceremonies of the church. Oh, yes. Dr. Chasuble is a most learned man. He has never even written any books. You can only imagine how much he knows. <laughs> I must see him at once on a most important christening. I, I mean, uh, matter, matter, matter. <laughs> oh. I shall be more than half an hour. Considering we have been engaged since February 14th, and I have only just met you for the first time today, it seems rather hard of you to leave me for so long a period as half an hour. Couldn't you make it 20 minutes? I'll be back in no time. <laughs> what an impetuous boy he is. I like his hair so much. I must enter his proposal in my diary. A Miss Fairfax calls to see Mr. Worthing on very important business, Miss Fairfax states. Isn't Mr. Worthing in his library? Mr. Worthing went over in the direction of the rectory some time ago. Oh, uh, tell Miss Fairfax to come out here and you can bring tea. Yes. Hmm. Miss Fairfax, I suppose one of the very many good elderly women who associate with Uncle Jack in some of his philanthropic work in London. I don't quite like women who are interested in philanthropic work. I think it is so forward of them. Hey, Miss Fairfax. Pray, let me introduce myself to you. My name is Cecily Cardew. Cecily Cardew? What a very sweet name. Something tells me we're going to be great friends. I like you more than I can already say. My first impressions of people are never wrong. How nice of you to like me so much after we've known each other such a comparatively short time. <laughs> Pray, won't you sit down? I may call you Cecily, may I not? If you wish. And you will always call me Gwendolyn, won't you? With 
pleasure. The matter's all quite settled, is it not? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Opportunity of mentioning of who I am. My father is Lord Bracknell. You've heard of Papa, I suppose? I don't think so. Outside the family circle, I'm glad to say that Papa is entirely unknown. I think that's quite as it should be. To me, the home is the proper sphere for the man, and once the man begins to neglect his domestic duties, he becomes painfully effeminate, does he not? And I don't like that. It makes a man seem so very attractive. Certainly, Mama's views on education, which are remarkably strict, means that she's brought me up to be incredibly short-sighted. So would you mind my looking at you through my glasses? Oh, not at all, Gwendolyn. I'm very fond of being looked at. <laughs> you know, you're a short visit, I suppose? No, I live here. Really? with the assistance of Miss Prism, has the arduous task of looking after me. Indeed. Your guardian. Which is strange. That is never mentioned to me, he had a ward. How secretive, Tim. He grows more interesting hourly. I cannot say that the news inspires me with unmixed feelings of delight. And now that I know that Ernest is your guardian, I cannot help but feel, well, I wish you were a little older than you appear to be. And not so quite alluring in appearance. In fact, if I may speak so candidly, pray do. I think that whenever one has anything unpleasant to say, one should always be quite candid. Well, to speak with perfect candor, certainly I wish you were fully for Ernest. Yes. Oh, but it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is my guardian. It is his brother, his elder brother. Ah, oh, that accounts for it. And now that I know who is his brother, very strange. They are not on good terms, I'm sorry to say. That accounts for it then, doesn't it? I quite fancy some tea. Shallow mask of manners. 
When I see a spade, I call it a spade. I am glad to say that I have never seen a spade. <laughs> <laughs> it is obvious we are from widely different, different social fits. <laughs> Many nice walks in the vicinity, Miss Cartier. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> From the top of one of the nearest hills, one can see five counties. Five counties? Oh no. I don't think I should like that. I hate crowns. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose that is why you live in the town. Quite a well-kept garden, Miss Cardew. I'm so glad you like it, Miss Fairfax. I didn't know there were any flowers in the country. Oh, there are quite as many flowers in the country, Miss Fairfax. As there are people in London. I don't know how anybody manages to exist in the country. That is, if anybody who is anybody does. Ah, this is what the newspapers are referring to as agricultural depression, I believe. The aristocracy is suffering from it very much just at present. It is almost an epidemic amongst them, I believe. Would you care for some tea, Miss Fairfax? Thank you, <coughs> detestable girl. <laughs> but I require tea. Sugar? No, thank you. Sugar is not fashionable anymore. Cake? <laughs> <laughs> Bread and butter? <coughs> Bread and butter. Cake is rarely seen in the best houses nowadays. <laughs> I would like to be 
allowed to ask my guardian? An admirable idea. Mr. Worthing, I have one question to be permitted to you. Where is your brother Ernest? We are both engaged to be married to your brother Ernest, so it is a matter of importance that we know where your brother Ernest is at present. Gwendolyn, <laughs> certainly. It pains me very much to be forced to speak the truth. The first time in my life I've been reduced to such a painful position. <laughs> quite an experience of anything of the kind. However, I will tell you quite frankly that I have no brother, Ernest. I have no brother at all. I've never had a brother in my life, and not the smallest intention of having one in the future. Have you never a brother of any kind? None. Not even of any kind. No brother at all? None. Not even of any kind. <laughs> I'm afraid it is quite clear, Cecily, that neither of us are engaged to be married to anyone. It is not a very pleasant position for a young girl to find herself in, is it? Let us venture back into the house. They will hardly venture to follow us after that. No, men are so cowardly, aren't they? <laughs> <coughs> this ghastly state of affairs is what you call bundering, I suppose? Yes! What a wonderful Bunbury it is! Oh. So there's no right to talk to Bunbury here! And that is absurd! One has a right to Bunbury anywhere one chooses. Every serious Bunbury has no right. <laughs> serious Bunbury is good, eh? Well, one has to be serious about something. What you are serious about, I have no idea about. Absolutely everything I should imagine. You have an absolutely trivial nature. The only small satisfaction I find in this wretched business that your poor friend Bunbury has quite exploded. You won't be able to go down to the country quite so often as you used to do, I do, and quite a good thing too. Your brother is a little off colour, isn't he, Jack? <laughs> you won't be able to escape off to the town quite as frequently as your wicked way was, and not a bad thing either. As to your conduct toward Miss Cardiff, I find you taking in the sweet, simple, innocent girl like that quite inexcusable to say nothing of the fact she is my wall. And I can see no possible ex uh, exception for your deception of the pretty and incredibly talented Miss Fairfax to say nothing of the fact that she is my cousin. I'm engaged to be married to Graham. That is all I love her. I engage to be married to Cecily. I adore her. So, uh, no chance to be married, Miss Cardew. I think the chances of you and Miss Fairfax ever being united are looking remotely slim now, Jack. That's certainly no business of yours. If it was my business, I wouldn't talk about it. <laughs> it's very vulgar to talk about one's business. Only people like stockbrokers do that, and they're nearly at the dinner party. You can sit there calmly eating cake, rendering this horrible job they can't make out. Seems to me perfectly harmless. Mm. It, well, I, I am in great distress. And eating is the only thing that comforts me. Indeed, when I am in really great trouble, as those who know, you, know me intimately will tell you, I refuse absolutely everything except food and drink. At the present moment, I am eating cake because I enjoy it. I am listening and distressed. As is heavily heartless to eat cake at all in certain stomachs. What about bread and butter in his death? I don't like bread and butter. So he had to spend the time making his own muffins in his own garden. No reason why he should eat all that cake like really was. Hey! Ask me to go without having any dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I never go without my dinner. No one ever does, except people like vegetarians and that sort of thing. <laughs> Besides, I've made arrangements with Dr. Chalzabal to be christened at quarter to six. <laughs> Dear, the sooner you give up this nonsense, the better. 
I have made arrangements myself to be Dr. Charles for this morning. We christened myself at 5.30, and naturally I would be taking the name of Ernest. Gwendolyn would wish it. We can't be both christened Ernest. It's absurd. It's like I have perfect right to be christened if I like. I see no evidence to say that I was ever christened by anybody. So we dropped a child on Entirely different in your case, however. You have been christened already. Yes, but I have not been christened for years. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you have been christened already. That's the important thing. Exactly. We know my constitution can take it. I should say it is <laughs> very dangerous you venturing into christening now without you having ever undertaken it before. Why? You can hardly have forgotten that someone very close to you was carried off with a severe chill in Paris this week. <laughs> yes, but you, you said the severe chill is not hereditary or anything of that kind. Well, it usen't to be, but I dare say science is making wonderful advances in these sorts of things. <laughs> that is nonsense, Albie. You're talking nonsense. I am not. Simply eating my tea. Cake. 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 Now, what would you rather? Would you rather me go? Yes. I wish I'd finish you would go, Algy. Why do you go? I haven't finished my tea yet, <laughs> and there is still a whole cake left. <laughs> <laughs> I am 
Mary is allowed to say, under the impression that she is attending a more than usually lengthy lecture at the University Extension Scheme on the Income of Permanent Thought. I will not undeceive him on this matter. In fact, I have never undeceived him on any point. <laughs> I would consider it wrong. You may understand, of course, that all communication between yourself and my daughter will cease immediately. On this point, I am firm. I am engaged to be married to Gwendolyn, Lady Bracknell. You are nothing of the kind. And now, as regards Algernon. Yes. Algernon? Yes, Aunt Augusta. May I take it that this is the house in which your invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, resides? No, Bunbury is not here at present. No, Bunbury is not anywhere, in fact. Um, but Bunbury is dead. <laughs> dead? What did he die of? It must have been quite sudden. Oh, he was quite exploded. <laughs> was he the victim of a revolutionary outrage? I did not know he was so invested in social legislation. If so, he was well punished for his morbidity. The, the, what, what, the, what, what happened was that he was, he was found out. He was found out. <coughs> the doctors found out that Bunbury could not live, and so he died. <laughs> <laughs>
The two weak points of society today are its want of principle and its want of profile. The chin is a bit high idea. Style is largely dependent on how the chin is worn, and they are currently worn very high. <laughs> Algernon. Sir, Aunt, I don't give I don't give tuppence about social possibilities. Cecily is the sweetest, kindest, prettiest girl in the whole wide world. And I don't care about society. <laughs> Never speak ill of society, Algernon. Only people who can't get into it do that. <laughs> My dear, you do understand that Algernon has nothing to do apart from his debts. But I am not in favour of mercenary marriages. In fact, when I married Lord Bracknell, I had no fortune of my own. Well, I suppose I must give my consent. Cecily, you may kiss me. <laughs> Thank you, Lady Bracknell. And you may call me Aunt Augusta from now on. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. I think we'd better have the marriage as soon as possible. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. I am not personally in favour of long engagements. They give people the opportunity to learn about one another. <laughs> Excuse me, Lady Bracknell, but this engagement is quite out of the question. I am Miss Cardew's guardian, and she cannot get married until she comes to the base, and I give her consent. That consent I absolutely decline to give. On what grounds? Algernon is a perfectly, I may say, ostentatiously eligible young man. He has nothing, but he looks everything. What do you want? It pains me very much to speak frankly about your nephew, Lady Bracknell, but I don't approve of his moral character. I suspect him of being untruthful. Yeah. <laughs> untruthful. My nephew? Impossible. He is an Oxonian. <laughs> I'm afraid there'd be no possible doubt about the matter. This afternoon, during my temporary absence in London on an important question of romance, he obtained a mission to my house under the false pretense of being my brother. Under an assumed name, he drank, I've just been told by my butler, an entire pint bottle of my Grey Brew 89. <laughs> and, my, and what special reserve for myself? Continuing his disgraceful deception, he succeeded in the course of the afternoon of alienating the affections of my only ward. He subsequently stayed for tea and devoured every single muffin. <laughs> what makes his conduct even more heartless is perfectly well aware from the first that I have no brother, that I've never had a brother, I don't intend to have a brother, not even of any kind. I distinctly told him so myself yesterday afternoon. After some consideration, I have decided to completely overlook <coughs> my nephew's conduct to you. <laughs> Very generous of you, Lady Bracknell, but my decision, however, is unalterable. I decline to give my consent. <laughs> Dear child, let me ask, how old are you? Well, I am really only 18, but I always confess to 20 when I'm at parties. You are perfectly right to do so. No woman should be entirely uh, correct about her age. It looks so calculating. Hmm. 18 but admitting to 20 at dinner parties. Well, it will not be long until you are free from the tutelage, and so I do not think it is really important to get your guardian's consent. <laughs> Excuse me again, Lady Bracknell, but I think it's only fair to say that According to Miss Cardew's grandfather's will, she does not come of age until she is 35. <laughs> I don't see how that could be a problem. London society is full of women who have decided to remain 35 of their own volition for many years. In this instance, it's my dear lady Dumbleton, who has been 35 ever since she arrived in London at the age of 40. <laughs> Can you doubt it, Cecily? Yes, I felt instinctively that you could wait. But I couldn't wait all that time. I hate waiting even five minutes for anything. So waiting even for marriage is quite out of the question. And what is to be done? 
I don't know. Mr. Worthing, as Miss Carter clearly states that she cannot wait until she is 35, a statement that I am bound to say shows a certain impatient nature, I must ask you to reconsider. But my dear Lady Brackwell, the decision is entirely in your own hands. The moment you consent my marriage with Gwendolyn, I was gladly let your nephew form an alliance with my ward. I hope you know what you propose is impossible. Then a passionate celibacy is all that any of us can look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> that is not the fate I propose for Gwendolyn. Algin is Miss Prism, a woman of repellent aspects, the most connected with education. <coughs> she is the most cultivated of ladies and the very picture of respectability. I am sure it is the same woman. <laughs> what position she holds in your household? I am celibate, madam. <laughs> Miss Prism, Lady Brackwell, has been for the last three years Miss Cardew's esteemed governess and valued companion. In spite of what I hear, I must see her. Let her be sent for. She approaches. She is now. I was told you were set to be in the vestry, dear Canon. I have been waiting for an hour and three quarters. Prism! Miss Prism! <laughs> Where is that baby? Twenty-eight years ago, Prism, you left Lord Bracknell's house in charge of a perambulator containing a baby of the male sex. You never returned. A few weeks later, through the elaborate investigations of the Metropolitan Police, the perambulator was found in far corner of Bayswater. In it contained the manuscript of a three-volume novel of more than usually revolting sentimentality. <laughs> but the baby was not there. Prism, where is that baby? Lady Bracknell, I admit with shame that I do not know. <laughs> the plain facts of the case are these. On the morning of the day you mentioned that day, which is forever branded in my memory, I had prepared to take the baby out in its perambulator as usual. I had also with me a somewhat old but capacious handbag in which I had intended to place the manuscript of the work of fiction which I had written during my <laughs> Surprising you few off hours. In a moment of mental abstraction for which I can never forgive myself, I deposited the manuscript in the bassinet and placed the baby in the handbag. <laughs> Miss Prism, this is a matter of no small importance. Me, I insist on knowing where the positive bag that contained the infant. <laughs> I left it in one of the larger railway stations of Greater London. <laughs> what railway station? <coughs> Victoria. The Brighton Line. <laughs> <laughs> I must retire from my room for a moment. Gwendolyn, wait for me. <laughs> if you are not too long. Inspect carefully before you speak, though. 
Happiness is more than one life depends on your answer. It seems to be mine. Yes. Here is the injury it sustained during the upsetting of a Gower Street omnibus in younger and happier days. And here, on the lining, is the stain caused by the explosion of a temperance beverage, an incident which occurred at Leamington. Oh, and here, on the log, are my initials. I'd forgotten I'd had them placed there in a fit of extravagance. It is indeed my... I'm delighted to have it so unexpectedly returned to me. Indeed, it has been quite the inconvenience being without it all these years. <laughs> <laughs> More has been returned to you than you know. I was the infant placed in it. You? Yes. Mother. <laughs> Mr. Worthing, I am unmarried. Unmarried? Well, do not deny it. It's a serious blow. But who has the right to pass a stone against one who has suffered? Can repentance act wipe out an act of folly? Why should there be one law for men, one law for women? Mother, I forgive you. <laughs> Mr. Worthing, there has been some mistake. There! It's the lady who can tell you who you are. <laughs> <laughs> Lady Brackle, I hate to seem inquisitive, but could you kindly inform me of who I am? I am afraid that the news I have for you will not altogether please you. You see, you were the son of my poor sister, Mrs. Moncrief, and subsequently, Algernon's older brother. <laughs> <laughs> I did not have a brother. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Prison, my fortunate brother, Dr. Charles, my fortunate brother, Gwendolyn, my fortunate brother. <laughs> Algy, you young scoundrel, you must have to treat me with more respect in the future. You've never treated me like a brother in all your life. Well, I must admit, I, I've been out of practice until now, old boy, but I. I dare say I'll get used to it now. My own! But what own are you? What is your Christian name now that you have become someone else? Good heavens, I don't talk about that subject. I suppose your chism subject to my name is honorable. I never change, except in my affections. <laughs> what a noble nature you have, Gwendolyn. Then the question must be cleared up at once. Um, Aunt Augusta, a moment. When Miss Prism had placed me in the bag, had I been christened already? Every luxury her money could buy, including a christening, was lavished on you by your doting parents. Then I was christened. It is settled. What name was I given? Oh, let me know the words. Well, naturally, as the eldest son, you were christened after your father. Yes, but what was my father's Christian name? I cannot at this moment recall. <laughs> so I have no doubt he had one. He was eccentric, but that was only in later years, and that was due to the Indian climate, and marriage, and indigestion, <laughs> and other things. Algy, can you recollect what our father's Christian name was? We were never on speaking terms, old boy. He died before I was a year old. His name would appear in the army list of the period, I suppose, Sergeant Augusta? Well, the colonel was essentially a man of peace, except in his domestic life. <laughs> ah, the army list the last 40 years. His delightful book should have been my constant study. Oh, let's see. Hudson, Tanner, Walker. Oh, what ghastly names they have. Magby, Bigsby, and Mont Moncrief! Oh, right. Colonel, 1840, Captain, 1869. Christian names. Ernest John. <laughs> <laughs> and my name is Ernest after all, Brentford. I mean, it naturally is Ernest. Yes, I do recall that the Colonel's name was Ernest. I must have had a reason for disliking. 
disliking the name so much. <laughs> Ernest! My own Ernest! Oh, I knew from the first you could have no other name! My own one. It's a terrible thing for a man to find out that all his life has been telling the truth! <laughs> <laughs>